And I want us to focus on some things concerning prayer this morning, in particular this prayer. What was pressing in the mind of Paul, in the heart of Paul, when he was thinking about the Ephesian congregation? What was it that they needed? That was what he was praying for, in fact. And so we're going to notice some of that. But I want you to first see that this was pretty typical of the Apostle Paul. Uh, if you want to keep your place there in Ephesians chapter 1, but look over at Philippians chapter 1, verses 9 through 11, you see very similarly, Paul says, And this I pray, that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment, that you may approve things that are excellent, that you may be sincere without offense till the day of Christ, being filled with the fruit of fruits of righteousness which are by Jesus Christ, unto the glory and praise of God. So that's not the only time he does it. Turn over again then to Colossians chapter 1. Again verse 9. Colossians 1 verse 9. It says, For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you, and to desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that you might walk worthy of the Lord and all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing, increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might according to his glorious power, until all patience, long suffering with joyfulness, giving thanks unto the Father which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. Now, just again, notice the the typical nature of what Paul is praying for. And what we begin to find out, of course, Paul is writing this to uh, the Ephesian congregation. He is writing all of these, really, by inspiration. But this was his prayer for this congregation. But what we typically find is because he is praying for something similar to the Philippian congregation, he is praying for something similar concerning the Colossian congregation and those brethren that are there, there was a common theme that you see in Paul's prayer for these congregations, which tells us then it is that which we too can see a need for in our own lives and the congregation even here at Nesbitt. So it's helpful to remember Paul is writing this by inspiration, yet these are things needful for the congregation. And so, as in most cases, what, what concerns are expressed in our prayers and in these prayers are certainly going to be applicable to us today as it was with the original recipients of this particular letter. So let's think about some of these things together. Now Paul begins with a recognition of their work, of their love, in fact. Uh, again, something that is common in the Lord's church and should be, and yet even in Philippians, a congregation with, with which the Apostle Paul truly loved and spent a great deal of time they worked with him from the, the, the furtherance of the gospel, the preaching of the gospel concerning the collection. They, they were the record-keeping congregation, if you will, a sponsoring congregation for the Apostle Paul. But he even tells them, I, I'm praying that your love may abound. But what we read here in Ephesians, and we read of their, their faith, and we read about their love. And yet, it was too something that certainly could be increased upon in their lives. And so we read about their faith, their love, and their gratitude, and his gratitude, rather, for them. He was very thankful for that congregation. And I think it's important to note when we think about the preaching of the gospel, the work is, that is to be accomplished, we need to realize that there are those upon whom we stand upon their shoulders, so to speak, to be able to proclaim the gospel truth. It, it would not be possible to continue in such a way without the support of good brethren, standing there supporting, holding those arms up of those gospel preachers and sending them out. I think about even our students. Jameson's gone to preach the gospel in another location this morning. They're, they're being trained at the, uh, at the Memphis School of Preaching to do that particular work, and we support them in that effort, and they're going to go out. And you think about the history of the congregation here, and you think about all the preachers that have literally been sent out to preach the gospel of Christ. It is a wonderful work, and I pray that we continue... Uh, in that work, and in so doing, to encourage those who would preach the gospel of Christ. But, but Paul makes mention their faith, their love, their work that they have accomplished, and he was thankful for them. And so let me, before we go any further, say how thankful I am to the Nesbitt congregation, affording me the opportunity, first coming here uh, in the capacity of a student, and, and having the opportunity to train and, and to grow up, so to speak,
uh, in the gospel, uh, in, in, the, in the preaching of the gospel, but also then to stand before you as your preacher and in this opportunity to be supported by you full time to preach the gospel in this community and as far reaching and abroad as we can with the gospel of Christ. It is a wonderful thing. And for that, I am truly indebted to you and thankful for you. I think of it as, as the work of a family because we are a family together. And so I don't think of myself just simply being uh, your minister. I think that we are all ministers and servants of Christ in that way. I just simply have an opportunity to stand before you in this particular capacity. And so let's remember that work together. But I am very thankful for the congregation. Let's look at some of the things in particular that Paul was thankful for. In verse 17 you read that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of Him. Paul was thankful, Paul was prayerful that they might know God. How important is that? Let's think about where it all begins, is in, with a knowledge of God, isn't it? In fact, you can read and you can open up the, the, the letter to the Romans and you find out that, that in fact, the, the very glories of heaven, the creation, God's handiwork, all of those things shout out that there is a God. And we find out that there were those in the early Gentile world that, that were not thankful and, and in fact uh, would not acknowledge the creator of such, but rather worshipped the creation. And so we find out then that Paul is prayerful that they might know God, that they might have a knowledge of Him. I would say to know God is of a great importance. We think about some passages, Jeremiah chapter 9. The prophet Jeremiah, uh, almost 600 years before the time of Christ, would make this statement to Judah. Thus saith the Lord, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, neither let the mighty man glory in his might, let not the rich man glory in his riches, but let him that glorieth glory in this, that he understandeth and knoweth me, God says, that I am the Lord which exercise loving kindness, judgment, Righteousness in the earth. For these things I delight, saith the Lord God. Jeremiah 9, 23-24. That knowledge of God is, in fact, eternal life itself. In this way, we see Jesus in his prayer. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. A knowledge of God is, is where it all begins. It is vital, is of a vital importance for our souls concerning eternity. And then we would have what Paul would write, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, beginning in verse 7. To you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them. Two groups of people, those who know not God and those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who says, Who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power? Again, 2 Thessalonians 1, 7-9. This knowledge does not just come by happenstance. It doesn't just come by chance. This knowledge of God comes through the spirit of wisdom and revelation, which tells us, if you go back and look at that in verse 17, he says, I, I'm making mention of you in my prayers, verse 16, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Him. So we find out how that knowledge comes. It comes by way of revelation. In other words, it has been revealed to the apostles. Those men inspired wrote it down. In fact, so when you flip over to chapter 3, Paul would make this statement. In verse 3, he says, How that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote a four and a few words, whereby when you read you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. He says, In other ages it was hidden to, uh, unto the sons of men, but now it is revealed unto the holy apostles and prophets. How so? By the Spirit. 
We find out the Spirit's work in this. To reveal God's will. To make known uh, God unto the world. To reveal Him unto the world. And so we find out, and of course, when you look at Jesus in His last couple days on this earth, before He would go to the cross, He spends that time with the apostles, and He's teaching them, He's reminding them, He's encouraging them to serve one another, John chapter 13. But in chapters 14, 15, and 16, Jesus would make this statement over and over, I'm, I'm going to leave you, but don't let your heart be troubled. I'm going to send unto you the Comforter. He's going to give you remembrance of things that I said when I was yet with you. He's going to guide you into all truth. He is going to reveal things. We find out the Spirit's work. And Jesus says, I'm going to go, but I'm going to send the Comforter to do that particular work. And so when you back back up into chapter, chapter 1 of Ephesians, you find out then... This is that work in whom you trusted. Verse 13, it says, After that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after you believed you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession of the praise of His glory. And then he says, Wherefore, when I heard of your faith and, uh, and, and your love unto all saints, I ceased not to stop praying for you, to give thanks for you. And in my prayers, I'm praying that you might know God. How so? By the Spirit revealing those truths unto mankind. Of course, he's writing in a first century setting then that reminds us here were spiritual gifts. They didn't have the written word of God completed at that point in time. And so those gifts would give them opportunity to know God's word. The Spirit of wisdom and revelation would give knowledge of him. And so Paul says, now I'm taking those things and I'm writing those things. So when you read my words, you will have an understanding of my knowledge, inspired knowledge, revealed knowledge by the Spirit, my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. And so he was praying for their knowledge. That knowledge would come by the Spirit of wisdom and revelation, that process of gaining that, that wisdom, that over time God would reveal it to his apostles or prophets then the apostles those things being written down so that even even uh, so many years later we can continue to know the very will of God and have a knowledge of him because that comes back then to that same idea what he expects of us we're going to be judged by his word John 12 and verse 48 and so we have to know God and so that question comes then do, do we really know God and how are we going to increase our knowledge in God and who He is, what He's accomplished, how He loves us, how He sent His Son to die for us? How am I going to increase my knowledge and His expectation of me in this life, living this life? What is it that I'm supposed to be doing? And how do I go about my day-to-day -day living before Him? Those things have been revealed to us in Scripture. And therefore, the question comes to us, do we know God. You see, we really have no excuse. We have His Word before us, and we can truly know those things because they've been given by the Spirit of wisdom and revelation. He goes on to then pray for them in verse 18, that their eyes of your understanding being enlightened. And He goes on after that, and He says that you may know what is the hope of His calling, the riches of His glory and the inheritance in the saints, that you might know the hope of God's calling, the eyes being enlightened. You see, that, that's, that's pretty simple to understand. When I, Paul explains it there again in chapter 3. When I read, then I have an understanding of what Paul was, re what was revealed to the Apostle Paul. My eyes then being opened up so that I can know of hope. See, hope is that thing that, that keeps us going, isn't it? When there is no hope, life ends. Life just stops. There's, there's no need to really continue on, is there, at that point in time? But there is hope in Jesus Christ. That hope which is an anchor for the soul, Hebrews 6 and verse 19. And, and in so doing, he says, I want you, I'm praying for the, that you might have and know not only God, but you would know the hope of His calling. You see, they were aware of that calling, being called by the gospel, 2 Thessalonians 3, 
in verse four, or rather two in verse twelve through fourteen. Where unto you he called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. We've been called unto his kingdom and glory that you walk worthy of God, he says, who hath called you into the kingdom and his into his kingdom and glory. We've been called out of darkness and called into God's marvelous light, first Peter two and verse nine. And Paul's desires that they might know hope. That they might know the hope of his calling. That word hope often is defined as desire plus expectation. But I like this idea. It is a confident expectation. You see, it's that that, that gives me some assurance. But that didn't just come out of thin air. That came from a knowledge of God's word. That, that came from my faith growing from God's word, Romans 10, 17. And knowing of God and knowing who He is and knowing what He has done and knowing that I respond properly, I can know the hope that is in Jesus Christ. Amen. And we see then in this particular passage, Paul has already revealed about that hope. In verse 4, he talked about being holy and without blame. The adoption of children, the praise of the glory of His grace, verse 6, being accepted in the beloved, having redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins, verse 7, to enjoy the riches of his grace, going on into chapter 2, the forgiveness of sins. This idea of hope doesn't just come out of thin air, but rather it comes through the gospel, through our knowledge of having obeyed the gospel. It comes by way of what is going to be revealed in chapter 2. If you look at verse 19, now therefore you are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God and are built upon, he says, the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord, in whom also you are builded together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. He talks about being built together as the temple of God, a habitation for the very Spirit of God, he says, this is where the work is going to be accomplished in the body of Christ, which he's going to talk about two chapters from now in chapter 4, that there is yet one body. And that body is the very plan of God to save mankind, we see even in this chapter, verses 22 and 23. It put all things under his feet, gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is the fullness of him that filleth all in all. The very purpose of God we find in church. To save mankind, yes, but also to give man hope so that in this life, with its difficulties, with its trials, with its storms of life, as we discussed in our class period earlier, those things, we can maintain our focus on Christ and we can continue on even with the storms beating down upon us. I wonder if we truly appreciate the hope of God's calling Again, revealed through the Word of God, just like in this letter. But Paul says, I'm praying that you would know God, and I'm praying that you would know the hope of His calling. Let's look further into verse 18. That they might know the riches of God's inheritance. God's inheritance. It's interesting. He says, we are His workmanship in chapter 2 there, in verse 10. Created in Christ Jesus, created in Him. We're His workmanship. We become His children, as we see, adopted as such, yet we become the, the sons of Abraham, essentially. We read Galatians chapter 3, by our faith in Jesus Christ, having been baptized into Christ and put on Christ. And that idea of that family, that you might know the riches of God's inheritance, what He has in store for those who were called by the gospel of Jesus Christ. He's already referenced the fact in the first part of the chapter that we are predestinated to the adoption of sons, verse 5, that, that we are in fact uh, those who have obtained an inheritance. You see, we already have that inheritance. We know that we have that inheritance because we have the guarantee of the Spirit's work in Revelation, verses 13 and 14. We know that we have that inheritance. We have that guarantee. Verse 14. 
You start putting these verses together, you find out the work of God. And he's praying that we might know God, that we might know the hope of his calling, and that we might know of his inheritance that we, in fact, have already obtained. That salvation that is in Jesus Christ. And again, he will mention that inheritance in the next chapter, that in ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. That we have in an inheritance. He speaks of fellow heirs in the next chapter, that at that time you were without Christ. He's talking about the Gentile. You were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope without God in the world, but now in Christ Jesus, you've been made nigh, you've been made near by the blood of Christ. In the Old Testament, under that old law, those, those Gentiles, they were, they were considered those far off. And several times we'll see that phrase being used. He said, but now you've been, you've been made nigh. You've been brought into the family of God. And so in chapter 2, when he's talking about you have quickened together, made alive in Christ to sit in heavenly places, you once were dead in trespasses and sins, and he said he's brought us together in that one body, having taken the, out of the way that old law, having nailed it to the cross, taken out that thing that stood between the Jews and the Gentiles, brought them together in one body in Christ by the cross. Verses 15 and 16 in that passage. They might know that inheritance, having become fellow Heirs, verse 12 and 13 in chapter 3 and verse 7. The Apostle Paul goes on in his prayer in verses 19 and 20 that they might know the power of God. That you might know the exceeding greatness of his power. To us where he says who believe according to the working of his mighty power. Twice it's stated there. Which he wrought or showed or made manifest in Christ when he raised him from the dead and he set him at his own right hand. In heavenly places. In that passage, twice he mentions that power. That you would know of the power of God. That you would know of the power of his greatness. And how are we going to know that? Again, it comes from a knowledge of God. Through his word, those things revealed. That we might know the hope of his calling. That we might know that we have obtained an inheritance. That we might know the very power of God. You see, a very real power that we're reminded of in every redemption story, in every story of salvation. Where were you before? I was lost in sin. A summary statement, but it may be so much worse. It may have been the way that they were living their lives outside of Christ, living for the world, living it up in the world, and so forth. Never acknowledging Jesus Christ. Never having uh, sat down and, and studied God's word and, and knew exactly what God expected of them. Or maybe it's worse than that. Maybe they did have opportunity to know and to study and have that knowledge. Maybe they grew up reading their Bibles and knowing. Had parents that loved them cared for them, showed them the scripture, showed them the way, maybe even having obeyed the gospel. And then maybe they go back into the world. You see, when we think about every redemption story, every salvation, every conversion that we know about. And I'm talking personally, mine, yours having obeyed the gospel, having put on Christ, having our sins washed away, we look back. Do we not realize the very power of God to save us from sin? We have an acknowledgement of the power of God when we look at His, His greatness and what He's accomplished in the creation. We go back to Genesis chapter 1 and we look at the creation. And then we look around us and we, and we can see that. And we can know of his great power, but spiritually speaking, you see, this is what he's talking about. Not just the, the, the power that God has to create, but also the power that God has to save. To save one from sin. What is the exceeding greatness of his power to us? Where do we according to the working of 
of his mighty power, which he showed, which he wrought in Christ, it says, when he raised him from the dead, set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places. These things that we're reading of, these things that Paul is praying for in this passage, they're not mutually exclusive. In fact, they are so well connected to one another that it's hard to see one without the other. That hope that we have, and we, we read in several passages, we are in fact saved by hope. The hope, the hope of what? The hope of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And he makes that connection here. The power that we've seen in Jesus Christ when God raised him from the dead on that third day, brought him forth from that realm of the dead. And his apostles, John wrote, we have handled, we've touched him, we've seen him, we've talked with him. We have handled of the word of life. 1 John chapter 1, verse 3. We know. He says, and I'm writing so that you would know the, the fellowship that we enjoy <coughs> is truly with the Father. We look at His power. We look at what's been accomplished. And that power is described as exceedingly great. In fact, some translations have this phrase, the exceeding greatness of of his power. And in accordance with that same power, he raised him from the dead. We go back to chapter 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according to as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. You look at the power, the wisdom, the love, the exceeding greatness of his power to save mankind. Before the foundation of the world to know that there would be this need. You see, you see phrases even in the Old Testament. You think about Israel of old being in Egyptian bondage. You think about how, how God brought them out of the land. And literally you read these phrases. He brought them out with a mighty hand. Exodus 32, verse 11. Deuteronomy 4, 34. How is God going to change one who is lost in sin? Who is corrupted by the lust of the flesh and the passions of life? Paul said it is by his power. Romans 1, 16. Paul would use this phrase. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is the power of God unto salvation. To everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. He also wrote that the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. And Paul says, I want you to know God. I want you to know of the hope of his calling. I want, you to, I want you to know that you have an inheritance in Christ. And I want you to know of God's power to redeem you, to save you from sin. You see, he's writing to Christians. And I find that amazing. He's writing to Christians. They already know the power of God for the salvation. They already have that hope of that calling. They, in fact, already know God, don't they? Why would they need Paul to pray for them? Why would they have this need? It's for this reason. And this reason applies to us as well. Because we need the very same. We need to be reminded each day. As we walk out of here, we're gathered together in, in what would be a safe place. A place of worship, a place of love, a place where we want to, to worship and serve God. And, and have done so beautifully this morning as we continue. And yet when we walk out of those doors, we realize that the world we're facing doesn't think the way that we think. And it's easy to be influenced by the world. That the world out there doesn't live the way that we are called to live. 
And we understand that that influence that calls us and our own desires and wants to look to the world as maybe the way that we should live our lives. But the power of God through His Word and the power of hope to maintain our faithfulness unto God. That's something that we all need. That's something that we need every day in our life. The Ephesians needed it. The Philippians needed it. The Colossians needed it. And I dare say we need it too, even here at Nesbitt. So this morning as we conclude, there may be those who have a specific need, who as a child of God has allowed sin to enter their life, repent of those things. Cast off that sin. Come back to God. Ask for forgiveness. Let us pray for you. Let us encourage you. Maybe it's the case that there's one here that's never obeyed the gospel. When we talk about the power of God to save mankind, will you obey the gospel believing Jesus is the Son of God? Would you turn away from the practice of sin, Acts 17, 30 and 31? Would you confess His sweet name as the Son of God, Matthew 10, 32 and 33, and be baptized to wash away your sins, Acts 22, verse 16? If we can help and encourage you to obey God, come forward while we stand.